Institute of Innovation and Industrial Management is an enabler of cooperations between industry and students. In innovation projects, the students are empowered to collaborate with industry partners, working on real-life challenges. Assisted by the staff of the Institute and backed by a generous budget to spend on their project, students run through all phases of an innovation process. In the new Schumpeter Laboratory for Innovation, lots of ideas are generated and tested by intensive prototyping. Digital production machines are used to come up with a fully functional prototype. After several iterations of the prototype, project results are presented to representatives from industry and university in a unique environment. The new lab offers state-of-the-art multimedia and communication systems. From a short 48 hours makerton to up to seven months course of product innovation, you can choose the innovation project that fits best for you. Learn more about innovation, product development, and the maker movement in this extraordinary experience. Hi, my name is Vlad. Participating in an innovation project was one of the most challenging but also rewarding experiences of my lifetime. Get in touch now. Hello everybody, my name is Christian Ramsauer and I'm really happy to see you here. Lots of familiar faces and we waited three years for this event today so that uh, people really physically come here to our uh, institution. We have some people online also, so hello everybody online. But uh, a special uh, thank you for you guys that you came to the institute, uh, to this location and uh, watch and listen the next uh, 120 minutes or so to our student projects. I'm really looking forward. I haven't seen anything, so I'm curious. Hopefully, uh, we are not disappointed, but uh, I'm sure you will be happy at uh, several student projects, what I heard so far from, from my staff. Let me uh, give you a little overview about this institution, about this uh, location. Um, we have a certain a cooperation with industry. It's called uh, Indust Maker Industry and Research. What's behind that? Uh, companies usually work together with research institutions on a certain research project, get fund funding from uh, funding institutions, and sometimes students are involved. We focus on our students. We think the students are the, the strong force of a university. So we have student teams uh, up to uh, six or 10 or 15 students with different formats where we offer the industry our students with our help from the, from the institute. We do physical and digital prototyping, especially in the other side of the room. So I would like to invite you after the show and after um, uh, some buffet, uh, go to the other side. That's the interesting side with 3D printers uh, a water cutting machine, uh, laser cutters, electronic uh, 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 prototyping machines. And, and here where we are right now, uh, we invested quite some money for an extensive uh, multimedia and communication system so that we can uh, connect with the world. We, we introduced that 2019, right before the pandemic started, so we, we used this uh, infrastructure quite extensively the last three years, but I was standing here alone uh, looking to a camera and nobody was in the room, that was not so, not so nice. Um, what are the formats we offer here at this uh, location? Uh, in terms of innovation, um, uh, the institute is called Innovation and Industrial Management. So innovation is thing about getting ideas to prototype and so forth. And then production to make sure that we produce efficiently in this high-cost country is a different 
a different animal, and in between it's called ramp up, uh, and that's that's what we basically work on at the at the institute. We offer design thinking and rapid prototyping also for our industry partners. Um, this concept of design thinking. Uh, developed from Stanford University a long time ago, uh, it's important that uh, companies are using that for getting new ideas and understanding customer needs, understanding the problem before you de develop a product. Then Makerdown, that's kind of a hackathon with 48 hours, but we also make, that's, that's why we say Makerdown. So um, students are working in small groups for company tasks, usually there are two or three, um, two or three uh, uh, teams who work for the same task and it's kind of a challenge so at the end the question is who who won also then spin ovation is a certain new format where we take patents owned by the university give it to students and see what can you do with the patents are there applications what you can do and sometimes really interesting things come out and uh, the idea is to uh, give that to organizations or or the students uh, start with a startup and product innovation, that's why we are here today. I want to show you a little bit uh, what this is. For those who don't know, uh, product innovation is a student team up to six, uh, five, six, seven students. It's interdisciplinary, so we have students from mechanical engineering. Uh, we are here at a school of mechanical engineering. And uh, I want to welcome the dean of, mechanical of our school of mechanical engineering. We have 17 inst institutes, and uh, but we all think about we are too much focused on mechanical engineering. So we need electrical engineering, we need uh, informatics, we need other disciplines, but we also need uh, um, business and uh, business models. And so there are universities, other universities here. And uh, we, we, so basically we work with different universities. Very international, so all the international, the course is in English as you can hear, so it attracts international students. It's easier for them to speak English than German. Um, uh, there, there's a real life task from the industry, so there's a task where a student uh, team work over six, seven, eight months, get, some, get a budget they can grab on up to 10,000 euros. And, uh, and how do we do it today? We, we are kind of inspired by this course, ME310 at Stanford University. And uh, I'm very happy that on our live stream right now is Professor Malu Kohn from Stanford University and watching us right now, uh, because next year we might host a conference uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and that topic, an academic conference. Good, uh, some numbers and then I will stop. Uh, we uh, so far did uh, conducted almost 70 projects in the last 15 years. The first project was 2006 with Mario Fallast, who brought that from Alto University this idea. We have 35 company partners. That's quite a, quite something in the last 15 years, and we are very proud that 30% of our students are female, and this is very special in the mechanical engineering area because uh, we have 2% females. 3%, 5%, something like this. So uh, we have 500 courses at the mechanical engineering uh, school, and this is the course with the highest amount of female every year, uh, 30%. Um, we have students uh, from 57 nationalities and from 51 uh, universities, as you can see here. Good. These are some numbers uh, and uh, some impressions, and I would like to hand over now to the moderators of today, it's Marion Unek and uh, Patrick Herstetter. Please come on stage. What a great start to the Innovation Gala. Thank you, Professor Ramsauer, for your kind words. Yeah, thank you. And um, I can just relate to what Professor Ramsauer said. I'm really excited to stand here in front of an actual audience once again. How are you, Marion? Absolutely. I missed that the last years. But don't worry if you can't join here today. We got you covered because with our live stream, we are reaching our community worldwide. And for that reason, we also want to give you a warm welcome, both the audience here in the laboratory, but also our viewers in the live stream who join internationally. So, Marion, what do we have on the schedule today? On our agenda today, are the six outstanding presentations of our student teams, a keynote by a Harvard Business School professor, and a panel discussion with experts from the industry. All right. But, Patrick, 
Let's give our audience now a quick overview why we are here today, the project Product Innovation. Yeah, let's run them through the journey that also our students experienced. So back in November, our students first met both their teams and they were introduced to their challenge. After that, they run through three main phases. Problem analysis, idea generation and rapid prototyping. And they were backed off, up with workshops, they met mentors, they had expert interviews, they also had some lectures and checkpoints in here. So they could work on their projects, create ideas, design concepts, and get a solution. Sounds easy, right? Well, there is more behind that. Another year passed, and we all were affected by the pandemic. As we all know, it wasn't easy to come back in the lab. We had quite hard restrictions, and the teams had to be more flexible than ever. Um, yeah, but now we are more happy to be here today, and we are really grateful that we can do it in person and really like super, super easy again. Um, yeah, now let's start and give a hand over Patrick to our first team, right? Yes, I think they got the idea now, so without further delay, let's start our first team. And um, let's start with two words, sustainability and mobility. Those two words, they can't go without each other these days. And one potential solution to combine that would be fuel cells. But have you ever thought about how fuel cells safety is ensured? Well, I can guarantee you that our next team has. So please. Welcome, Mirda and Lukas from Team Hydroheads. Seventy-five percent of all CO2 emissions in the transport sector are coming from cars and trucks. That needs to change. We need to reduce CO2 emissions from the transport sector. This is the reason for a growing market of fuel cell systems in vehicles. Therefore, the production of fuel cells is also growing. With this rapid growth comes great responsibility. So. Our responsibility was to ensure safety of fuel cells. To ensure safety of fuel cell systems, our challenge was to detect leaks external and internally fast in a reliable and efficient way. But how are we going to go do that? This is our solution, and that is how we're going to do that. Our system features a pressure decay test for the detection of internal leakages, a negative pressure hood to detect small external leakages, and most importantly, an optical gas imaging system. Optical gas imaging is a technique to make escaping gas visible. This novelty in leak testing is our solution to localize leakages. With this localization technique, we're also able to optimize the repairing of defect fuel cells. Okay, let me show you how this optical gas imaging can look like in a hands-on solution. Here you, can see, um, here you can see a container not leaking as a reference. Here a slightly leaking container and here a heavily leaking container. From these pictures, you can see that we can cover a big range of leakages. And this, with this prototype, we were able to prove our concept and our overall solution. Okay, enough with the tech talk. Let's talk about business. With our solution, we can detect external as well as internal leakages, reduce testing time to about only 40%, decrease the overall operating costs, and most importantly, ensure passenger safety in fusel vehicles while cutting down CO2 emissions. And now, after all of that, keep in mind, rethink, rethink emissions. emissions. Well, thank you, Mira and Lukas, for contributing to sustainable to mobility of tomorrow. Thank you, guys. So, now... All of us are familiar 
with electrical shavers. But have you ever thought how the shaver blades are driven? Our next team took this challenge and reinvented the drive concept for small care products. Please welcome Romana and Tobias from the team Racerheads. Ah, I cut myself again. And now even the battery is dying. Romana, did you use my shaver for your legs again? <laughs> the blades are dull and the battery is empty. Uh, sorry, uh, I didn't find the right charger. Plus, mine is making those weird noises again. But why are there even so many parts in there which can break? I wish somebody would come up with a better solution. We have come up with a solution. With the model Erase Old Problems, we developed a new drive concept for an electric shaver. This is Tobias and I'm Romana, and we are representing Team Razorhead for Pyre International Technologies. Pyre is a big player in the B2B market by developing and producing electric shavers and small personal care products. The goal of the moving blades in an electric shaver is always the same, cutting hair by moving back and forth. But what is now the big difference between conventional solutions and our solutions? The big difference is how the transformation of the energy to, to the blade is achieved. A conventional system needs multiple complex parts and multiple complex steps. First, you have a motor which creates a rotational movement, which is then transformed into a linear movement, which is achieved by an eccentric and a tappet. Not with our e-waste technology. We go the straight way. So let's have a closer look what the E-Race technology actually is. Our innovation is a promising solution for the future and therefore top secret. Right now, we are in an early stage of a patent consideration and that is the reason why we're not able to share any technical details with you. But we, we still want to give you some hard facts about our drive concept. So the drive con concept itself is directly connected to the blades, which means that the output is a direct linear movement. The drive concept is, pow pow is powered by electromagnetic forces and is built in a smart and simple way. So what makes our technology actually that special? The compact design creates new possibilities in ergonomics and the, in addition, the size of the drive also allows for new designs and more freedom in economics. As we have mentioned before, the transformation of the energy can be done either in a complex or simple way. We go the most direct, and therefore we need fewer number of parts which could break. Additionally, there are less numbers of power components which are moving, which corresponds in the higher efficiency because there are less parts where friction could occur. Furthermore, our innovation was able to re reduce the noise level by a lot. To sum it all up, the e-waste technology allows new possibilities in the electric shaver market and in design and efficiency, and is therefore a revolutionary entry in the electric shaver market. So that we now have solved all our problems in the bathroom, we can go on and solve all the other ones. We are Team Razorheads for Pyre International Technologies. Thank you very much, Romana, Tobias. Looks like you could change some of our daily bathroom habits and save some relationships as well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so let's continue with our next team. Um, and it's about cranes. Cranes are devices that consumers hardly notice in their daily life, but still they are very important for a lot of purposes. Have you ever seen a crane lastly throughout the last few weeks? Have you ever given a second thought to them? Probably not, but our next team for sure has. So they were been working on lightweight solutions for crane extensions, so-called chips. Please welcome Ilinka and Paolo from Team All The Way Up. Hello, everyone. Let's center together the palm finger universe of lifting solutions. Here you can see one of palm fingers trucks and it is equipped with a crane, which leads us 
to the object of our challenge. On top of the crane, a jib is mounted through a standardized interface. This tool is a great one to lift loads up to 650 kilograms in the most difficult conditions. Normally, this jib is struck and is kept and must fit in the truck that you've seen before. And when in use, it can be extended in a telescopic manner. As you can see, the jib consists of beams, but also some connection elements and sliding mechanisms. They are made out of steel, and right now they weigh around 100 kilograms. The reason why another lifting machine is needed in order to mount it on the crane. This is neither efficient nor convenient for Palfinger's clients. Therefore, the jib has to be redesigned so that one person can carry it and mount it on the crane in a safe manner. We had the job to provide Palfinger with a thorough technological evaluation and different solutions in the field of flight weight design and different solutions. Well, Ilinka, and I think lightweight design is a popular topic these days, and all of you can think of some solution in order to reduce the weight of our jeep. Of course, we can choose another material. We can choose carbon fiber, titanium, or go for a multi-material approach. Or we can think about adapting the cross-section or the overall geometry for a better behavior in bending. Good. And let's make use of the best manufacturing processes out there, additive manufacturing and laser cutting. Easy, right? But we need to combine these concepts in a way in which we can provide the best solution and while we still stay in our constraints. So let's go up the stairs to th the different results of our technological evaluation. First of all, the carbon jib, made out of carbon fiber reinforced polymer that solved our problem in no time with a weight reduction of 70%. Indeed, Paolo, but maybe a five-meter carbon beam doesn't fit in our truck. I think I have a better idea. Since 3D printing is such a big topic nowadays, we can apply topology optimization to our jib and then 3D print it in a titanium alloy. Moreover, this technology will allow the integration of the connection parts and sliding mechanisms. Well, actually thinking like it right now, maybe it would be too expensive for, for, Palfinger, for Palfinger to, pro to produce so many pieces per year 3D printed. What do you think? You are right. I know, I know. I have the cost-optimized solution. We will still make use of topology optimization, but we do not 3D print our jib. It can be easily produced by laser cutting metal sheets and then bending them into the desired shape. And this is our final product, a plug and play solution that Palfinger can already produce through the standardized processes. The weight is reduced by a third and it still carries the desired load to make our customers happy. And here we come to the end of our journey from the initial jeep to the topology optimized one. Oh, the way up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, team, all the way up for your great presentation. We are now coming to uh, an highlight of our agenda of today's meeting, um, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Stefan Tomke. Uh, Stefan Tomke is an authority in innovation management, and he's a supporter of our institute and of the TU Graz now for a long time. He is William Barclay Harding Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School, and a frequent conference speaker and advisor of global business leaders. He has taught and chaired executive education programs on innovation, R&D management, product and service development, and operations, both at the Harvard Business School in Boston and in company programs around the world. In addition, he is the author of Experimentation Matters. He published a book uh, a long time ago and over 100 articles, case studies, and notes were published in books and journals such as Harvard Business Review or Management Science. 
I want to mention that uh, Stefan is uh, by training an electrical engineer. He got his PhD from MIT and has four master or five master degrees at uh, MIT in operations research uh, in Arizona State University, several <coughs> degrees. Uh, he uh, became, uh, he got recently the honorary doctorate of Graz University of Technology a few weeks ago. Stefan, thanks for coming and we are looking forward for your presentation on Experimentation Works, his newest book. Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, a huge welcome and thanks, uh, Christian, for that most generous introduction. It's great to be with everybody here today and again, thank you for uh, uh, willing to listen to, uh, to what's uh, new about my book uh, and uh, hopefully I can give you some ideas around sort of why experimentation matters, why it works and so forth. And you'll see uh, sort of my book right here. And so what I wanted to do is just to get us quickly into sort of the setting of why experimentation works is I want to start out with an example, uh, a very simple example that comes from Microsoft. So Microsoft, as you can see here, is a company that's always trying to find new ways to improve customer engagement. And uh, one fine day, and you see the current practice on the left-hand side, you know, this is their search engine. And uh, they were a sort of uh, trying to kind of figure out ways, again, inviting people to come up with these new ideas. So what you see in the current practice here on the left-hand side is where they set up sort of their search words. And what they do is they have very short headings and then a lot of sort of context below that. And they found that people have very low attention spans. And so what you need to do is you need to keep the message short. And then again, context kind of comes later. So one fine day, an employee has an idea. And the idea is, he said, why don't we actually move some of the subtext into the headline? Now, of course, there's a good reason why they have that subtext sort of below the headline, but it's an interesting idea. And the question, of course, that we always have when we have new ideas in companies is what is the possible outcome? And there are three possibilities. One possibility is it makes it worse, makes it better, or in many cases, there's no difference at all. And uh, so what do you think, and I, I can't really see the audience, but maybe think about it. What do you think is likely to happen? Do you think it's going to make it worse, better, or no difference? And uh, think about it a little bit. Now, the manager who was listening to this employee said, well, it's kind of an interesting idea, but I'm getting many new ideas every single day. This is not one of the better ones. So let's just wait a little bit. Okay, so the employee goes away. Now, how do we usually find out whether an idea works? Well, we run a focus group. The problem, of course, with focus groups, and we know this very well, is you, know, you get people into the room and you ask them what they want and they'll tell you that they want the salad, and the moment they leave, they'll buy the cheeseburger. This is, the research has shown this very well for a number of reasons that people don't actually tell you often in these kinds of settings the truth. Their behavior is very different than what they said. So in this case, going back to Microsoft, and the employee kind of waits and waits and waits. About six months later, finally runs out of patience and decides to launch an experiment. Just goes live with this thing. Now, Microsoft has something like 2,000 KPIs that they use to monitor sort of their performance, their sort of website performance. And they also have alarms if something unusual happens. In this case, the employee launches this test and the too good to be true alarm goes off and shuts it down. Now, usually when the too good to be true alarm goes off, there's a coding error. Somewhere in the software, there was a mistake. And uh, they try to find the mistake, but they can't find the mistake. So they run it again. And again, the too good to be true alarm kind of kicks in and shuts it down. 
Now, they're getting now really curious and they started to investigate. They launched in other markets and it turns out that this is true. In fact, it turns out that this simple change was one of the most successful experiments that Microsoft has ever run. This simple change resulted in more than $100 million of additional revenue in the first year alone for Microsoft. And again, more than $100 million of additional revenue for all the subsequent years, so annually. So why am I telling you this story? Well, I'm telling you this story for three reasons. First of all, in sort of in, in innovation, we always make this assumption that big performance changes require big innovations. Well, in this case, in the digital world, that's not true. Turns out that actually small changes, incremental changes like this, can have a big impact on performance because of scalability, uh, you know, goes to a lot of people, and you can do it instantly. Second, opportunity cost. If Microsoft had never run the experiment, they had never known that they left more than $100 million on the table year after year. So the experiment actually uncovers opportunities that companies are not aware of. And third, it's about empowerment. You know, the fact that the employee could actually run the experiment without going through lots of layers of red tape and permission made it possible for Microsoft to discover this. So this is really exciting and I'm so glad to be here. I'm so glad to be with you again to share my excitement and hopefully by the end of sort of this presentation, you'll be excited about experimentation in the way that I'm excited about it. So what's going on today? Why today? Well, we're seeing some big changes in terms of how we think about innovation and, and decision making. The digital age is actually bringing the scientific method to sort of the way we make, make decisions, and it does it in a turbocharged way. What you'll see here on the left-hand side, you'll see a, a really important book called Novum Organum. It's written about 400 years ago by Francis Bacon, a philosopher based out of London. And this Novum Organum later became known as the scientific method. It set the foundation for the scientific method which has really changed our lives now for hundreds of years. Well, what's really powerful is that we can now bring this scientific method into sort of this experimentation cycle where we can generate uh, hypotheses, we can run experiments, and we can learn insights very, very quickly, and we can turn this wheel faster than ever. I'm sure Francis Bacon would have been thrilled to be alive today just to see all these sort of things come to fruition. Now, often when I give lectures, people sit there and saying, okay, great. So I know you're going to talk about experimentation now, but can you take me, can you give me, give me the takeaways up front, just in case I get distracted or I fall asleep or anything like that. So I'm going to tell you three takeaways for today, very quickly. First of all, experiments are the engine of innovation. I've been studying innovation for more than 25 years now. And I can tell you for sure, if there's no experimentation, there is no innovation. Now, the engine has become more powerful than ever. So that's really exciting because there are some amazing things that we can do, whether we're brick and mortar or whether we're online, that we couldn't even think about just 15, 20 years ago. But to take full advantage of this power, you need to create what I call an experimentation organization where experimentation is like running the numbers, like running a financial analysis. It has to be second nature to an organization. So to show you how this works, let me take a quick detour into what innovation actually is. You know, there are many innovation definitions floating around. The way we think about innovation is really to think about two things. Uh, innovation is of course, novelty, we always associate novelty with innovation, but it's also about value, okay? So novelty plus value, which makes it very different than, for example, the word invention. You know, invention is really more a legal term. It's about patents, you know, and, you know, as we all know, there is really no value requirement in patent. It has to be new, 
not obvious, never published before. So invention is an input to innovation, but it's not quite the same thing. The outputs of innovation could be many things, product services, new experiences, you know, new customers, new markets, and then oh, most of all, and perhaps that's the most difficult, is new business models. How do I create new business models while I'm trying to actually make money with an existing business model? Now, innovation also comes in different degrees. We just learned that incremental innovation, especially in digital, can be extremely powerful. But then, of course, we also have larger ones, breakthrough innovation. And once in a while, we have what my colleague Clay Christensen called a disruptive innovation. The reality is, though, is most innovations in the world are incremental. And I think that's actually OK, as long as it's combined with the occasional breakthrough or disruptive innovation. So why is this innovation so hard? The reason it's so hard is because of uncertainty. You know, when we sort of uh, try to run a business, we face many kinds of uncertainties. We face R&D uncertainty. We face production scale up uncertainty, customer experience uncertainty, mark uncertainties. There's uncertainty all around us. And how do we usually deal with uncertainty? Well, we rely on our experience. You know, I'm sure all of you have many, many years of experience. We think we've seen something before. So we apply this experience to a new situation. The problem, of course, is with experience is what we call the hippo effect. Hippo, by the way, stands for highest paid person's opinion. And you know very well, you know, once you put a hippo in the room, you know, sometimes the discussions don't quite go the way you want them to go where we may have a situation where A, the data says that A is the clear choice, but then the hippo kind of thinks we should go for B, you know what happens. And by the way, we are all potential hippos. Nobody is safe here. I've kind of tell you, uh, here's an example of a hippo. This is an executive named Ron Johnson. Now, Ron Johnson, uh, Famous executive, he was uh, an executive, retail executive at Target, then joined Apple and created the Apple Store together with Steve Jobs. You know, Apple Store, as we know, is the most successful retail concept in probably recent decades, uh, has the highest revenue per square footage out of really any industry. Uh, Ron Johnson was the equivalent of what we call a retail god. He could not get things wrong. J.C. Penney, a big U.S. retailer, decides to bring Ron Johnson on board as the CEO, gives him a big pay package, and tells him, do sort of the things, the magic that you did for Apple, do it for us. He gets going very quickly, changes everything. 18 months later, J.C. Penney is fighting for survival. Ron Johnson is fired, and they're trying to bring back the previous CEO to restore things to where they were before Ron Johnson joined. So what went wrong? Well, I can tell you one thing is they did not test. There were no experiments. He completely followed his experience and intuition. And in fact, the danger that you kind of run into came to light when he actually came to Harvard Business School and talked about his experience. By the way, Ron John is not an arrogant person. He actually comes across as quite modest, but he had a word for what he ran into. He called it situational arrogance. Again, situational arrogance. He said, you know, when you're an executive, you're faced with situations where you think you have all the answers, where you're completely confident. And this is when you're in the most danger. So that's when I got it wrong. That was this big mistake. Now, some of you may say, well, that's fine, but we now live in the world of big data and analytics. So we can use all that big data to address these gaps that we have or these dangers that we haven't experienced. Well, maybe. Here are three problems that you face when you're dealing with innovation. First of all, by definition, there's less data around when you're dealing with a lot of novelty, because if there was a lot of data around, that means somebody has already done it and it wouldn't be very novel by definition. 
So data scarcity is always a problem in innovative environments. Second, context, of course. We just learned from Ron Johnson that even though it was all about retail, but retail at Apple is not retail at JCPenney, is not retail at Target. These are completely different environments, and the experiences don't actually port across these different contexts. And then the third, and this is probably one of the most difficult and most fundamental issues, is the issue of causality. In management, we make many decisions and many assumptions about causality every single day. In fact, every decision that we make, we assume that our decision, our action, causes some outcome to happen, like giving the salesperson a bonus. We assume that the performance of that salesperson will increase. But how do we know that all these causal assumptions are actually true, especially as the world is changing around us? Well, we often rely on correlations. That is, we assume that there's some association between something that we've done and something that happened. But correlations can really put us on the wrong track, these kinds of observations. Let me give you some famous examples of correlations about life that really can put you on the wrong track. There are three famous correlations uh, that we know about. Arm size, for example, correlates very highly with life expectancy. The smaller your palm, the longer you expect to live. Now, please keep your hands in your pockets. Don't look at your hands quite yet. Uh, ice cream sales correlates highly with drowning deaths. We know that as well. And then, of course, a study that I found in Belgium, which sort of, uh, sort of told me that more cleaning by man correlates with shorter lives. Uh, men apparently really love that study because it gives them the perfect excuse not to do anything. Now, of course, we look at these things and they're just correlations, observational studies. The true causal variables are very different. In fact, on palm size, the underlying causal variable is gender. Women, on average, have smaller palms and they, on average, also live longer lives. Now, how do we know that men have shorter lives? Well, that's how we know that men have shorter lives, because I think women would never try to do something like this. Uh, on ice cream sales, the causal variable, of course, is warmer temperatures. We know that very well. And then, you know, the study in Belgium, we don't really know. There's a hypothesis that men are more careless with cleaning chemicals. Uh, I don't know. My Belgian friends, you know, that I have, they probably drink them. I don't know. Uh, but we'll have to find out whether that's actually true. The bottom line is be very careful about observational studies because they don't usually reveal the true causality, and that has been shown over and over again in medical science and other fields as well. So what are we going to do? Well, that leaves us with the notion of experimentation. Experiments in addition to these things, so I'm not saying that experiments are replacing experience or replacing big data, but you need to have it as your third leg to the stool. You need to add experiments to your portfolio of experience and big data. And it's always been a big role. You know, In fact, when you go back and study the history which I've done on innovation, you'll find that experiments have always played a big role. Whether you go to Thomas Edison, where he thought about speed, you know, he wanted to kind of get as many experiments in into 24 hours, uh, where you look at Jeff Bezos and Amazon, and you can read his annual sort of letters to shareholders. He's always talked about experiments and the ability to do many experiments and to do them fast. You look at Google and many others. And in fact, when you look around and you look at all sort of the major digital platforms today, uh, what they all have in common, first of all, when you look at these platforms is, that probably all of you have used at least one or two of them in the last two or three days. But what they also have in common is that all these platforms and a few others run more than 10,000 experiments on you and me every single year. And they use these experiments to drive their decision making, to drive their innovation, to drive sort of their performance improvements. But it's not just digital but it's also in 
physical environments and brick and mortar environments. And all these companies actually run brick and mortar kind of experiments in stores, in retail outlets, and I can add more companies to this list as well. And this is kind of a rising movement and more and more companies are discovering the true and surprising power of these experiments. So you may say now, okay, I get it, this is great, but so how do we use them? What do we, how do we do this? Well, first of all, and in the spirit of like today's discussion is what I wanna kind of make sure that we understand that, that this is not about great, just great technology, yes, the technology, these platforms are enabling technologies just like a really fast Formula One car. It's fast, it's expensive, sexy, can do lots of wonderful things. But if you take these technologies and tools and you throw them into the organizations, what I've personally found in my research, the following happens. And in fact, this is true. You know, we can take these amazing technologies, we can throw them in there and they're not moving. And the reason they're not moving is if you want to become a true experimentation organization, you need to completely change your attitude. You need to rethink your process, your culture, and your management. Now, how will you do this? Well, I want to give you just quickly three pieces of advice that we can kind of work with maybe later in the panel discussion as well. First of all, you need a repeatable process. And the question that I always ask organizations, you know, who may tell me, well, we're already running a few experiments. And it's always a great question to ask is the 10x question. What would it take to do 10x or more? Because when you ask the 10x question, suddenly, you know, small changes are not going to do it. You're going to fundamentally have to rethink how, in this case, you run experiments. So you have to think about scale. Do I have actually an infrastructure that allow me to run quality experiments? Because I cannot rely on people to come up with sort of their own experimentation infrastructure every single time. Scope. When I do this, let's assume I have an infrastructure. Where do all the hypotheses come from? Some of these companies that I showed you, they have 500, some of them even 1,000 experiments per week. Well, where do the 500 to 1,000 hypotheses come from? Where do we tap into it? How do we build sort of this pipeline to do this over and over again? And companies have actually done that. And then, of course, speed. How do I move fast? You know, subject, of course, to some mathematical constraints in terms of how long an experiment has to run. But how can I do it fast? How do I make sure I have a lot of momentum? I call it high-velocity experimentation. Second, Culture. Culture is really important here. How do we actually develop the right behaviors, beliefs, and values that allow us to become an experimentation organization? The first one that I found that's really important is what I call cultivate curiosity. If you don't have curious people, you're not going to experiment. So you need to hire for curiosity. You need to cultivate their curiosity once they're there. How do you hire for curiosity? I asked this question one senior executive in a company that I studied, and he said, oh, it's very simple, Stefan. Here's what I do, is when I interview somebody for a new job, I always count the number of questions they ask me. And if they only ask me one question or ask me no question, chances are they're not going to be very curious people, and then I have no use for them because they're not going to come here and challenge things, challenge assumptions, or ask questions that we can investigate. And when you sort of cultivate curiosity, you also need to allow sort of a positive attitude towards failure. Now, I want to make sure I draw a distinction between what I call failures and mistakes. Failures are something positive because there is a learning objective. Mistakes are something different. Mistakes are something where we have made a mistake in a past project and we're making the mistake again. There's no learning objective here. So we want to maximize failure, but we want to minimize mistakes. That means when someone comes in with a breakthrough idea, we need to make sure that there are not heads on the wall and basically sort of reminding them that you don't come to the boss basically sort of with an idea that could potentially fail. Second, data needs to trump opinions. Really, really important. That is, 
if we already made up our minds in terms of what we are going to do, what's the point of running an experiment? You know, so you have to have an open mind. You have to follow the data. And that doesn't mean that you blindly follow the experiment. Sometimes there are strategic or contractual reasons why you don't want to do it. Uh, but at least you need to allow the experiment to shine a light on a decision. And so we ourselves are actually sort of are, are, are honest about why we're making decisions, even though sometimes they fly in the face of evidence, which means that hippos have to be tested as well. So you got to see a picture here of uh, Satya Nardella, who is the CEO of Microsoft. His employees have actually given him a little hippo, which you see placed right next to him. And that little hippo is there to remind him that he's the biggest hippo in the company. So he needs to be careful about injecting his own biases, his own assumptions into the conversations about decisions and let the data rule. And third is democratizing experimentation. Really important. We have to empower people and to do the kinds of things that where I talked about, especially you know, in the Microsoft example. And to do that, we have to have total transparency. It has to be completely sort of transparent in terms of what company, what people will do, what kinds of experiments they run. You can build a community of feedback and so forth. How do you do that? Well, started a company called Booking.com based out of Amsterdam, and they do this constantly. So if you've been on Booking.com, booking trips, booking hotels, you will have been part of their, their experimentation ecosystem. It's just a fact. They're running tens of thousands of experiments each year. Uh, there are quadrillions of landing pages around. About 75% of their core employees in Amsterdam are actively involved in experiments every single day. And anyone at Booking.com can launch and stop an experiment. There's total transparency. And they're not just using it for optimizing their website. But they're also using it, as you see on the left-hand side, sometimes to explore new strategies. Here's an experiment that they ran where they wanted to create a Google-like landing page, and then they wanted to see how people react to it. They have a lot of traffic. You know, before COVID, they had around four to 500 million visitors per month. So they can do a lot of different things, and it forms their decision-making. And in fact, when I spoke to the executive, one comment still sort of really rang with me. It's David Wisman's sort of observations. He said, it's, it's not a technical thing. And uh, David Wisman's told me, he said, it's a cultural thing that you have to fully embrace. Two questions. How willing are you to be confronted every day by a wrong you are? And how much autonomy are you willing to give to people? And if the answer is no to these two questions, it's not going to work. Finally, on the third one, I just quickly want to say a few words about management as well. You need to adopt a testing framework, things like what makes a good experiment, so hypothesis, feasibility, and so forth. And you need to learn how to think and act like a scientist. This involves five steps. I just published an article in the Harvard Business Review that actually explains what these five steps are and why they're actually important. And it also is important when you're trying to do these experiments. You need to also make sure that you always have a baseline and a control. As my friend Gary Lofman once said when he was the CEO of Caesars, he said, there are three ways to get fired in my company, and he was serious. Theft, sexual harassment, and running an experiment without a control group. And he was really serious about actually enforcing that. So we want to basically make sure always have a control group. So let me close up by saying, so what is your job in this kind of environment? First of all, I found three things that are really important for executives who are leading in an experimentation organization. Set a grand challenge, first of all. You want to make sure that people have an objective or a challenge to experiment towards and have sort of then break it down into a set of hypotheses and KPIs. Second of all, make sure you put the right systems in place, systems, resources, organization. Yeah. And that also involves making sure that you remove red tape. Like in this case here, people are often lost in the Mason organization. That means they go through it and they get a lot of no's. There are many no departments. You have to replace the no departments. You have to empower people to do this. No departments removed. There have to be multiple paths to yes. And then third, be a role model. Have humility. 
it's okay to go into a meeting and tell people, I don't know what the answer is, but let's run an experiment and find out. And I gotta live by the same rules. Everybody in the hierarchy has to live by those same rules. As you may have guessed by now, I'm a huge uh, reader of science and love everything about science and so forth. And I wanna close it with a statement by one of sort of my, one of my favorite scientists, a guy uh, named Richard Feynman, who was a professor at California Institute of Technology, got a Nobel Prize in physics, very colorful character. But he, one time when I was listening to one of his presentations, actually at Cornell, he said something that really stuck with me. He sort of talked about science, and, and, but you can apply the same thing actually to business as well. It doesn't make any difference how beautiful your guess is. It doesn't make any difference how smart you are, who made the guess, or what his name is. Let me add to this. It doesn't matter where you are in the hierarchy. It doesn't matter how beautiful your PowerPoints are or how persuasive you are in a meeting. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it. And he was talking about science, of course, the essence of science, but I think the same things can be applied to management as well. So I, I'm, I got my time is up here, but uh, I just wanna, if you're interested in more, you know, there's a lot more out there. Here's sort of the book, here are the different chapters. Uh, and later, you know, we have a panel discussion, so I'm happy to, happy to take any questions and then kind of connect that back to your own context. So again, thank you so much. Uh, time is up and I'm gonna hand it back over to uh, Christian or whoever is going to do the next introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. You. You got a big applause of roughly 100 people <laughs> Thank right, you. in the room. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, he has been here a few weeks ago, so he knows how the room looks like. We learned a lot about experimentation. <laughs> uh, we see more and learn more about later at the panel. Thank you, Stefan. And I want to hand over to Mario, Mario Unek. Thank you. We go back to the context of mobility, but this time we are talking about public transport. <laughs> um, yeah, and public transport, namely our loyal companions, trains. And for some of us, we take it may granted that they are always on time and that they always work perfectly. That this stays this way, our next team challenged it. So please welcome Dorcas and Jonas from Team Opt Track. Today we're going to travel into the future. And as all good adventures, this one begins with a quest. A quest for more efficiency and digitalization in the train maintenance process. So sit back and enjoy the ride. Our journey today is made possible by our industry partner, UBB TrainTech, and more specifically, Werkknittelfeld. You may not know it, but UBB TrainTech makes sure that you arrive at your destination safely every time. They inspect trains for damages and repair and maintain them before something dangerous might happen. To give you a little insight into what this process looks like, we created this slide. Every maintenance process is going to start with an inspection. But currently, for the field workers, so the train inspectors and the maintenance workers, there are no digital tools, which means that they are working with long paper checklists. These checklists can have up to 50 pages, and there's a different one for each vehicle. Once the inspection is done, the paperwork is handed to an office worker, who then digitalizes it and is only then able to order spare parts, which of course means that train maintenance can only start afterwards. As you might recognize, this process is not the most efficient, and UBB Train Tech recognized that. So they were looking for a, a solution to make the detection of rail vehicle collisions more efficient. And as a team of software and mechanical engineers, we came up with a solution that we call the modular maintenance system. And now, our modular maintenance system is built around an application that we programmed from the ground up. 
It can be used with your standard end devices, so a phone and a tablet, which the workers are also already accustomed to. And then we also have some hardware, which Jonas is going to demonstrate to you. We designed a magnetic train attachment for the worker as a hands-free option. And then there's also a wrist attachment for the phone. And on top of all of that, we have assisted reality glasses that can be used to take pictures via voice command. And now we want to run you through the process of how our application works. So let's begin. We're going to start with a train inspector, Jonas, who's currently opening the application on the tablet, logs in, and can select the train model that he is inspecting. Once he has done that, he can, of course, take pictures via the wheelware. Take pictures. <laughs> Now he can continue filling in the checklist. As you can see, he can add the pictures or take different ones via the tablet. He can, sub he can start filling in the checklist with the damages, and once the entire checklist is filled out, the documentation is sent to an office worker. So, as you've just seen in our short demonstration, when we build up a system that connects the different clients at our partner, it will be Knittelfeld that there are the office workers, the train inspectors, and of course, the maintenance workers them themselves. So compared to the present process of EBB, we have the huge benefit of a real-time data synchronization, which leads, at the one hand, to an uh, um, optimized and accelerated um, client documentation between different um, clients at EBB, and therefore al allows us, at the one hand, to order spare parts um, earlier and therefore also start the train, ma ma the train maintenance process itself earlier on. This which reduces the overall process time needed and therefore um, gains some potential time savings. So what are the advantages of our system we came up? Next to the potential time savings we came up with, we have at the other hand also an improved um, documentation to our digitalized approach. We have a high acceptance rate by the maintenance workers and the workers at UBB themselves because we build up the system with them together by scratch. We have a modularized approach which would, it, which would allow us or will allow us to um, scale it in size, which can later lead to further development. And we have, of course, our more efficient communication between different clients, as already mentioned. So we hope you had a pleasant ride and thanks for joining us. Well done, Dorcas, Jonas, thank you for the ride. I really enjoyed um, coming home safe. Um, and yeah, your maintenance application really looks like an improvement in several areas. Thank you. Okay, so right now we will stay in transportation, but not transportation of people, but transportation of carbon dioxide. And its transport is more complicated than you would maybe think and that's mostly because of uh, corrosion. But I'm not the expert here, our next team is, so let's let them do the tech talk, and please welcome Ines and Stefan from Team Carbon Booster on stage. Good afternoon. We are Team Carbon Booster, and today we would like to share with you what we've been working on for the past seven months. Let's get started um, by elaborating why our solution is relevant to all of you. Global temperatures have been rising for decades, and I'm sure everyone has heard about increasing CO2 emissions being a problem. Many processes emit CO2, and burning anything will produce water and carbon dioxide. Therefore, we cannot completely, um, we cannot completely avoid CO2 emissions, but how can we reduce them? We can collect the emitted CO2 and either store it or use it for fuel production. However, most of the time, not only CO2, but other impurities such as water are emitted as well. During transportation, this mixture leads to corrosion, especially under elevated temperatures and pressures. Therefore, 
there is a need to develop and test new materials. But how can we perform material tests under pipeline conditions in a lab? Our challenge was to build a system to add precise amounts of impurities in the PPM range. Because water is the main contributor to corrosion, we decided to focus on the addition of water. I'll hand over to Stefan, who will introduce you to the technical details. Yeah, thank you, Ines. So how do you get the impurities into the test environment? One obvious solution might be just dropping a few water droplets directly into this test vessel. However, since we only are dealing with precise amounts of impurities, the manual addition is just imprecise. Therefore, we've developed this process flow diagram. It looks intimidating, but it's actually really simple. At the top, you can see dry CO2 entering the system. One part goes directly to the mixing point, whereas the other part moves to a humidifier, picks up 100% humidity, and then recombines at the mixing point. And by controlling the ratio which moves to the humidifier, you can precisely adjust the humidity and the mixing point. This humidity can be measured and used to calculate back to the actual impurity level. Now the gas is fully prepared and can move further to the test vessel. And the one thing I would really like to draw your attention to is this humidifier, since it is the heart of our system and show you what's going on inside. You can see dry CO2 entering a container via pipe bubble through a water path where it picks up humidity. However, there are some challenges to be overcome to reach full 100% humidity after the bubbling, since the actual humidity will depend on water temperature, the container height, and the bubble size. And since the first two parameters have been fixed for us, we went for reducing the bubble size. So instead of just having a pipe which reaches into a water, we created a 3D, we 3D printed a nozzle which can be put at the end of the pipe and therefore reduces the bubble size. And we didn't just investigate all of this in theory. Uh, we fully assembled the prototype, validated our concept, and after multiple tests and generating lots of data, we can say that our technology definitely has a future in corrosion testing. To sum it up, with our prototype, it's possible to perform corrosion tests, uh, perform corrosion tests on, uh, on materials with water as an impurity, ranging from the PPM up to the percent range. Also, while having a small measurement uncertainty of only 10 ppm of water, reproducible experiments can be performed. And by having designed a system which is fully compatible to existing test plots, our prototype is ready to be used. And with all those factors combined, we are sure that our prototype will definitely help to perform tests on materials for a carbon neutral future. Thank you. Thank you, Ines. Thank you, Se Stefan. Your solution will be next step for a cleaner and greener future. Thank you. So, wow, amazing how fast this innovation gala is rushing by. We are now at our last student presentation for today. And here, the key words are safety and pyrotechnics. May for the un one or the other person not fit together, but it should. So, let's introduce... Rupert and Selma from Team Mindblown. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm sure you're all familiar with this sound. You probably associate it with destruction, but what if we told you it can be the launching pad for protection? Imagine your company gives you the task to use their drone and to create great video material. You get everything started, everything works fine, but while flying, it happens. You lose control of the drone and it plummets to the ground. Thousands of heroes down the drain and you could seriously insure people. This scenario is more common than you think. As, um, approximately 30% of drone pilots have crashed their drones according to current estimates. With a steadily growing market, this problem is becoming more and more prevalent. We need a solution. Ladies and gentlemen, look no further. 
We are team mind blown, and we have a dare solution. We simply call it DOPE. Selma, would you tell us what DOPE stands for? It stands for Drone Overall Protection Equipment. Let's see how DOPE works. As you can see, we have created a revolutionary and unprecedented parachute and airbag combination for maximum drone safety. Let's break it down. When it comes to parachutes, altitude is the crucial attribute. Existing solu solutions need 10 meters of altitude for the parachute to fully deploy. Anything less than 10 meters is worthless totally. Within our project, we really focused to deliver an improved solution to this problem. After various experiments with a pyrotechnical trigger, we were able to decrease the activation height. A tube shoots into the parachute vertically. Additionally, air streams out of jets in the tube. This helps to deploy it horizontally. Now with this approach, the parachute only needs four meters of altitude to deploy. This is a groundbreaking innovation to parachute deployment mechanisms. You as a customer can now operate safely, even in low altitude areas, and additionally, we can minimize your insurance costs. Our airbag is an absolute game changer on the market. With its neck pillow shape, it is the first ever solution to completely protect your drone from critical impact. Together with the rapid speed of a pyrotechnic explosion, it inflates in less than the blink of an eye. DOPE combines the revolutionary parachute with the unprecedented airbag to create the groundbreaking solution that is essential to the future of drone safety. With DOPE, Team Mindblown will fly you into a safer future. Thank you, Selma. Thank you, Rupert. I'm sure you can save a lot of tears from drone pilots and maybe also some money, or probably. Um, yeah, so this was already our last team presentation of today, but I'm sure we are not finished yet, right? Yeah, you're right, Patrick. And we heard a lot of impressive solutions today. And as a product innovation experience comes to an end for one generation, a new one starts. And therefore, the registration for product innovation 2023, 2020, 2022, 2023 starts today. We are really looking forward to see some of you next year with us on stage. So now, Marion, let's close this as we started it back in November. Um, don't follow. Create. And now, let's see what the industry has to say about experimentation. And for that reason, and for our panel discussion, please, Professor Ramsauer, join us on stage. Also impressed by the student uh, presentations, uh, especially the last one. I have to mention uh, uh, the company Astrotech, uh, formerly its name was Hirtenberger Automotive Safety. Uh, Hirtenberger, you know, is uh, well known for munition. Uh, the company sold their munition and get, got green and uh, is focusing on pyrotechnical solutions for the future. And I would like to welcome Gerhard Schuster as uh, somebody who changed the company quite a bit the last 20 years. He is 91 years old. I met him yesterday in Munich at a fair and he drove from Vienna today to, to uh, support us. Thank you very much, Gerhard, that you came. Okay, let's uh, continue with our last agenda point. Uh, that's uh, 
uh, the panel discussion, we heard a lot about experimentation, uh, business experimentation from Stefan Tomke. Uh, Stefan Tomke likes fast cars, uh, so do I. Uh, there was the Formula One Grand Prix last Sunday. I was watching that. Uh, it's uh, still exciting to see uh, motorsports, and I would like to welcome two special guests today from the motorsport area. I will start with Ellen Lohr. Uh, please come on stage. Welcome, Ellen Lohr. Hello, Tisa. Hello. And uh, secondly, I would like to uh, say hello to Matthias Dank, Dank who, who couldn't make, couldn't it, make quite it quite today, today to Graz, but, but he's online, he's online here. here. Okay. Okay. Matthias, Matthias thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you for having me here. And, uh, and uh, Stefan, Stefan is still online, so we have to check that we see. You guys can see everybody, right? Okay, perfect. Yeah, works great. Um, well, uh, let me introduce a little bit. I introduced already um, uh, Stefan. Let me talk a little bit about uh, uh, Miss Ellen Lohr so that you know a little bit more about her. She was a, a racing driver, of course. Uh, and she got the title in Formula Ford uh, 1987. She was second place in the 24-hour race in Nürburgring in 1990. And between um, 1991 and 96, Miss Lohr drove in the Deutsche Tourenwagenmeisterschaft, DTM. And uh, 1992, she won the Hockenheimring DTM race. And she is the first and only wom woman so far to win this male-dominated sports uh, uh, of the DTM. Um, afterwards, she, she continued racing in the rally ride races from 2004 to 2011, um, focused also in, in truck racing, finished her career, motorsport career 2016, and joined AVL as a director of motorsports 2021. Correct. I come to uh, Mr. Matthias Dank. Uh, Matthias Dank uh, studied technical mathematics uh, at our university, TU Graz. Afterwards, he changed to the company AVL, uh, where several uh, representatives are here, CTO Sums. Um, so uh, 2005 to 2020, Matthias Dank was working at AVL, always in the racing area, as a lead engineer racing simulations, uh, a system designer racing, and global business segment manager racing. Since 2020, he switched to motorsport as a director of motorsport at McLaren Applied. So why, why did we come up with this panel? Well, in motorsports, uh, I learned that experimentation is essential in order to win races. Uh, I, would, I would like to ask now our motorsport uh, experts, and I start with uh, um, Ellen Lohr, um, how does experimentation work when you are a motorsport driver, a team? How do you do it uh, when I think about the Formula One Grand Prix last weekend? What role played experimentation? How does it work? Can you tell us a little bit? Of course. Um, first of all, I would say you should have experimented a bit with cushions on this sofa because it only looks <laughs> <laughs> looks nice, but it's uh, as you can as we can see on how we sit here, uh, uh, it needs a bit of improvement. We can lay down too. <laughs> <laughs> no experimentation is is or oh, let's say innovation is no doubt about that. A lot of uh, things for the automobile industry come from the motorsport always played a very, very innovational role. When it comes to experiment, experiments, um, I don't feel so 100% well because I would say experimental thinking is the key to success in motorsport, but not experiments because actually, why? Because when you make a mistake and trial and error and you on the error side, then potentially the driver loses his life or the uh, the car crashed or whatever. So we would, I would say, experimental thinking, meaning in a way engineers in motorsport can really think very openly because there is regulation, there are regulations, but not as many as in the automotive industry. So we allow engineers to really think about everything, even illegal uh, solutions, to try to fit these solutions into the regulations given. 
And this is, of course, different uh, than in the, in the automotive industry, where you're from country to country, have different uh, regulations uh, uh, from the European Union, et cetera, et cetera, which you have to strictly follow. We also have to strictly follow, but we, um, we go, yeah, we, we fight with an open visor, first mm -hmm. step. So yes, that's the faith of experiments. But then it's all based on simulation and testing because nobody would do an experiment, a real experiment on a race weekend. Because when you do, I think Matthias is, uh, will tell you the same, when you do an experiment on a race weekend, uh, it's a beginning of failure normally. And that means you're really in, in a bad condition because everything, all your work, more or less, let's say 95, 98% should have been done before. And there, again, simulation and testing is very important. We trust in big data. We have much, much, much data, as you can imagine, when we do a tire model for a vehicle simulation uh, um, uh, software, dynamic software, we have, we have uh, uh, Franz, you can answer the question maybe better than me, thousand parameters for a tire model, for example. This is data mm -hmm. we can trust in. We have in AVL, just to give you an example, when we talk about software, we have 26 coders only doing the software for the racing, preparing every single category at its best, meaning it's a constant, constant uh, uh, input of data, of course, from the mm -hmm. teams, from the OAMs, and that is uh, something we really have to trust in. Nevertheless, we do our experiments virtually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to save the drivers and the car, more or less. Mm -hmm. And the thinking is, yes, very, very straight. It's very straightforward on... Are you sure you can... Yes. Mm -hmm. I think we have a little problem, but... The, um, yeah. Sound. Yeah. Better. So it's um, also what uh, uh, Mr. Tonke said, it's about the speed. When you look at motorsport, we have to be quick. The car for the next season is already running on the test beds or in the simulation or even in real the year before. And uh, with the cost caps we have to fight with Formula One, uh, but also in other categories, this slows, should not slow us down. So we have to be innovative in thinking, in building up good processes, that's the key. And uh, therefore I would say yes, experimental, but not trial and error, please. Mm -hmm. So experiments not in, in, in real life, but first in the computer to make lots of experiments, simulate, and then make sure that you understand the system's behavior, do a lot of experience, uh, experiments. So software at AVL in racing is quite strong, right? You, 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 are, uh, you are helping the racing industry with your products. Absolutely. My colleague always says uh, uh, people could meanwhile think we are a, a software company, but actually we are an engineering company, 11,000 people all over the world, 110 people nearly in only racing, now ABL Race Tech, just, we had a, just a rebranding two months ago to oh, right. more show that we are a technical provider for the industry, the motorsport industry. And um, yeah, so yeah, tells it all. We always have to say we are an engineering company which happens to do software, but software, of course, be, uh, plays a vital role as well, as other fields. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Matthias, um, how does that differ at uh, McLaren Applied? And can you tell us a little bit uh, in that area what, what Alan just mentioned? I would say on the experimental side, all of motorsport, I would slightly disagree, never leaves the stage of being experimental. Uh, and I always have a little bit of hard time to say uh, motorsport is so well connected to automotive. Yeah, just by the coincidence that most of the vehicles we race also have four wheels. Some have two, some have none, but it's just racing two wheelers. Uh, bringing that together and I think TRL technology readiness level it compares it quite well. Anything that you have on the street is somewhere in between TRL level six and uh, eight or nine, whereas motorsports, experimental pilot, demonstration pilot, somewhere between four and five, maximum level six. So we are always racing prototypes. Uh, I think it's fair to say that no matter what you do in professional motorsports, never has a product readiness level. Um, on, on, because we don't need to, because we have very safe, 
conditions, safe environment, the racetrack is a safe environment, we have highly professional drivers, so we don't need to go through all the safety stages, so we stay very experimental. And on the other side, we kind of like the experimental thing because um, we always learn more from the moments when we fail compared to our victories, which is not from me, but from the late Nicky Lauda, who said, who said it quite well. But um, and in all of this, uh, the big advantage or the big, where does the big drive for innovation come from motorsports? Because our regulations always change. Um, the laws of physics to make a car very fast is only one part of the set of rules and regulations that every contestant, every party that competes within motorsports must comply. The other part is sporting and technical regulations. And sporting and technical regulations are something that are very unnatural and artificial because the background to that is it's an entertainment industry. So no matter what you do, um, it has to be a good show. And that's the marketing value behind it. And a simple proof for that is, if you were to build the fastest car in the world, it would look nothing like a Formula One car. It might look more for, for example, like a McLaren Speedtail. That's a fast car with aerodynamics, with the shape behind it. That is what a really fast car that only needs to comply to, to the laws of physics must look like. But Formula One cars, Formula E cars, NASCAR, whatever you have there, we Every, we very often alter the regulations of what we're allowed to do, how the car can look like, in order to make it a good and interesting show. And uh, I think there also comes the, the, the drive for innovation from the motorsports industry. And we are on the R and D side, we're more on the D side than the R side. To be completely honest, there's not much research that happens in motorsport. Research happens at universities, that's technology demonstrators. But we are the big, the biggest thieves everywhere in the world. And this is where the real innovation uh, part, I think, really reflects is you think about something that you have seen somewhere and find it applicable to your specific problem that you have. And a lot of the ideas that we've heard today during the presentation show that. I mean, okay, yes, uh, you have a parachute, you have a, uh, an airbag, nothing is new about that. But finding out the problem uh, that you need to deploy that at a certain altitude, but we can accelerate that. So we take an explosive measure, which we have in airbags, also to deploy the parachute fast. It's just taking the ideas from somewhere else and putting it together in a, in a new environment to solve problems uh, in, a, in a complete different way. And that's the innovative part behind that. And coming back, experimentation is just the core of everything what we do. Yes, we would all love to do all our experimentation purely virtual in the computer because it's the cheapest part. You don't need to build a prototype and the ex test execution is very easy and you don't need no instrumentation because you see everything in the computer. Still, you need to do a lot of experimentation in the real world uh, just to be sure that your simulation models are correct and uh, give you the right insight and show you in the right direction. So not a lot of car crashes in the real world when you do simulation. That's uh, ideally you can leave that to the virtual world, but every now and then we we, we still crash in the real world. <laughs> I, I I know Matthias uh, quite well, so I I have to say something to this. Uh, I do not really 100% agree that you say we just pick parts and then make something out of it which fits into the regulation for motorsport. I personally think it's still super innovative. I mean, we don't talk about the time. In the beginning, when the let's say the the safety belts or the the full full uh, face helmets were invented in motorsport, or the first aerodynamic the ideas, that was exactly the time of experimentation. By the way, I think about a car from the 60s, this cigar form with this. I don't know if uh, the one or other had a picture in mind with this the rear wing, which was like mm -hmm. two meter fifties high in the air, something because people thought that's a good idea because there was no simulation exactly uh, uh, of course so that was a, a lot of try and error and sometimes somebody lost his life mm -hmm. because this uh, wing would potentially break and kill somebody who was driving behind i don't know if that ever happened just to to to, to give you a picture mm -hmm. But uh, nowadays, especially when we talk about components, when we talk about processes, there's a lot of innovation which still affects the automobile industry. I'm pretty sure about that without going into details. 
Stefan, you wrote uh, a case study on Formula One uh, and a case study on Ferrari. So you are not just <laughs> a, a motorsport uh, um, um, uh, fan, but also you did that also because of uh, experimentation. Tell us a little bit, yes. why did you do these case studies and what did you learn from uh, Formula One and, and, and from Ferrari? I, I've learned a ton of things, but before I do, I, I want to just... Uh... Uh, say to Ellen Laura that I'm I'm extremely jealous uh, that uh, just looking back at your race career, I had uh, the pleasure of actually uh, doing uh, some laps with Jürgen Watt in 1993 in the Le Mans car at the time. And uh, that was just a blast that I could see that doing it for years. Uh, so absolutely wonderful. Uh, Christian, to your question now, uh, why uh why was i interested in formula one well we're always interested you know uh, half the world is interested in formula one and uh and i was really as an engineer i'm I really interested in kind of the stuff that happened behind the scenes and i wanted to kind of know how things get done and uh and i've heard a lot about you know all the technology that goes into say, these races and so forth it was just pure curiosity and when i went in there I saw innovation and experimentation everywhere. Of course, not surprisingly, that's just the lens that I look at the world, uh, but I saw it everywhere I looked. And it was a tremendous experience kind of to be inside a Formula One team. This was, by the way, for context, uh, I had the privilege of spending quite a bit of time with Lotus F1 team at the time. Uh, Eric Boulier was the team leader. He later on went to a McLaren, by the way, yes. And... Uh, <clears throat> And just a few things that I learned, uh, Christian, from this, and I'll give you maybe a few quotes, a few points that I sort of took note. Uh, lessons for experimentations, lessons for management, in general, lessons for other companies. Uh, uh, there's one quote that I never forget that someone actually told me, and I don't remember quite who it was. I think it was actually the CEO of the team at the time. He said, to be fast on the track, you have to be fast off the track. And that is a really important part. That is, in order to be able to race, you know, you, you, there's a lot of logistics involved. There's a lot of technology development. You, you got to be really quick. You know, you can't delay things. You can't sit on decisions and all that. It was really important sort of to keep that in mind. That was sort of my first lesson, I guess. Yeah. My second lesson is to look at the teams themselves. Turns out that interesting, you know, at the time, by the way, Lotus F1 team had a very successful season. They placed fourth, actually, in the Constructors' Championship. They had Kimi Raikkonen placing third at the time and uh, spent about $180 million. Well, there was Toyota, who spent eight years, actually, in Formula One. The last time I checked in the last year, their budget was like $446 million, and they never won. And so my second lesson was throwing money and technology at a competition is no guarantee for success. There are other things that actually have to work. Just being the biggest, I mean, it helps to have resources, but that's not going to make you win at this race. Third is an experimentation and integration. We heard a lot about simulations, about maybe experiments with the cars and prototypes and all that. Well, it's all of it. All of this is about experimentation. Uh, I've learned that the team, the, the head of engineering told me, he says, we produce about 30,000 design changes over a season, okay, over racing, 30,000 design changes. So you're going to have to simulate, you have to prototype, you have to do a lot of things in order to just to pull that off. Uh, so integrated experimentation, integration between simulation, prototyping, also integration with a team and the drivers, everybody has to kind of work hand in hand in order for this to be possible. Fourth, I've also learned what kills competition, what makes you actually a poor performer in Formula One, and I think that equally applies to business as well. I wrote down organizational silos, slow decision making, and poor communication are surefire ways to lose races. And I don't want to sort of uh, insinuate that maybe that was Toyota's problem, but it certainly was probably part of the issue there as well. And my fifth one is applying this even more to business is that incrementalism here, high velocity incrementalism is actually a way to compete. In fact, uh, in one of the observations that we had is they told me about they were working with Unilever at the time 
on, on a project and uh, they wanted to share best practices from Formula One with a company. And they made this comparison. Unilever is trying to kind of basically save 1% on each sort of soda can or a soda bottle in terms of cost. And we're trying to find a tenth of a second on the racetrack. Well, the problems that we face are actually quite similar. We're trying to find these really small changes in performance. Companies are trying to do this, but we want to do it, you know, tens of thousands of times in order kind of to win the race. So anyway, so these are just five of many, many takeaways in this really, really amazing sport, which I was able to witness actually in Miami a few weeks ago again. It was a lot of fun. Well, you're talking about uh, operations and companies. Uh, I remember uh, Porsche uh, started Porsche Consulting a while ago, yes. focusing on operations. Uh, I learned that also McLaren started a com consulting company. So, um, Alan, um, what do you think, and, and, and Matthias, what do you think, what uh, we have here in this room several uh, business leaders. Uh, uh, the question is, how can business learn from motorsport uh, what would you what what advice would you give business leaders um, in, in terms of your experience on, on motorsports honestly um, again hello hello ah. <laughs> technical failures the, um, I heard everything in the in in the speech earlier <laughs> Because talking about failure or mistakes, talking about uh, decision, uh, how they are made, talking about the teamwork, and last but not least, you mentioned it just now again, the communication. These are all these things which have, which have to be, work perfectly in motorsport, and then you have a successful business as well. For me, it's the same. Mm -hmm. So communication and the perfect team is a, is a crucial element what business leaders can learn from motorsports from our side. Matthias, what, can you add something to this? Yeah, I would even stress it more. Take that decision. With everything that I've seen in other industries, very often people are too hesitant to take the decision at the time. There is a time when you need to take a decision. Take all the information that you have, take your scrutiny, make your plan B, make your risk assessment, but then take the decision. Be brave enough to take a decision and be brave enough to eventually fail. And if you fail, it's not the end of the world. Take something out of the failure. Do the post-mortem analysis and see why have we failed. What should we have seen differently? And I think that's the, that's the big difference between successful motorsports organizations and less successful motorsports organizations. It's the, it's the culture to failure. What do you lay, learn out of it and be a learning organization? But then, uh, and also Stefan said it, take the decision. Very often in our, in our business processes, it's joint indecisiveness that leads to prime disaster. Take the decision. It's the best you can do at the time. Doing nothing is the worst you can do. Mm -hmm. Talking yeah. about mistakes, what I learned in a very male in, uh, working environment, uh, it's, um, I want to connect it to the communication topic because it's... Um, good to talk about the mistakes and what i found out that uh, that's a big mistake not to talk about it because then the shit gets even better uh, uh, bigger yeah uh, mm -hmm. to say it like that mm -hmm. so um i don't know in particular if it's a male problem <laughs> but i would say there are some hints yeah mm -hmm. um so yeah t talking openly about mistakes so then find a common solution quick that is also mm -hmm. a key to success and that is Again, the same in businesses than in motorsport, I think. Very interesting. Just, I want to add maybe yep. to, to Matthias's point uh, as well on the decision making, which I, again, me just as an observer, you know, this is not what I do every day. But I found that quite fascinating. And I ask myself, why is it that in companies people hesitate for such a long time to take decisions? And I think the problem is in many organizations is rigidity. That is, uh, you know, they, they don't take the decision because it's very hard for them to undo a decision. Well, in Formula One, it's very flexible. <laughs> that is, you take a decision and you get it wrong and then you take another decision, another decision. Well, they'll make 30,000 changes over a season. So you want to have a lot of flexibility and rigidity is kind of the enemy of this and uh, which kind of freezes people up. And so they know if you're hesitant, so, so it's, it really is all about speed, not just on the track. It really is about speed off the track. And uh, you take a decision and you revisit it and then you do it again and again and again. And if you hesitate, if you wait, you know, you, you are at a competitive disadvantage. And 
So I saw that and it's not just in the engineering side, it's on the logistics, on everything, because you have to imagine, you know, you're racing one weekend in some some country, and then, you know, the next weekend you have to be another country. And in between, you have to tear everything down, you have to tear your platforms down, you have to put them in containers, you have to ship them, you have to go back to manufacturing, they have to remanufacture parts because parts are being consumed as part of the races. You have to go through customs, you have to fly. Yeah, and there's just so much involved. And so if you wait, if you hesitate, you're dead. <laughs> and uh, so, so I think that is a powerful lesson. I think that companies can can learn is you, you got to introduce more flexibility, flexibility sort of into sort of your decision making process and, and just go for it. Yeah. Flexibility is a very, very important keyword as well, I think. But uh, just to, to uh, answer to that quick decisions, of course you can fail with quick decisions we have only to look about ferrari last weekend come in come in stay out stay out so <laughs> yeah exactly make clear he was not That's happy the risk. so uh well i would like to invite the audience uh to also ask questions uh if you have something uh on your mind and i see the hands up uh at the second row can we organize that this gentleman gets a microphone Is it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I read a couple of weeks ago uh, the books of uh, the book of uh, Professor uh, Tomke, and uh, I want to create a bit of context for a short question. Uh, he was saying at some point, for the results to be trustworthy, high-quality data must be used. Outlayers uh, may need to be excluded. Collection errors, uh, collection errors identified. Uh, how do you see on on the motorsport? Uh, this thing uh, because uh, you are having a lot of changes in uh, in your uh, way you are doing the, the regulation and so on are, are changing a lot uh, how you identify this kind of uh, errors and uh, this kind of outlayers that the professor tom is uh, talking about in order to get uh, high quality data thank you are you asking me yeah well, we uh, at AVL, we do it with testing. We are very famous for our test beds. That is the origin of the company, actually. Mm -hmm. And also very sophisticated test beds for uh, racing applications or race cars. And um, with the simulation, what I said. But also, of course, uh, in the debrief, you learn everything um, after the race. I'll give you a small example. When I talk about procedures for a race team, yeah, how do we can we do better? Of course, we collect the data, but very practical. When we were, um, I was racing for Mercedes and DTM, and we had a team per car to build up the car and to do the maintenance between the races. Meaning it was a debrief that went wrong, that went wrong on another car, so we have to change things, etc. But in the end, all, let's say, four or six race cars were in a way different. And if it was only a little cable which was left uh, put to the left side instead of the right side on the other car so it was difficult to find the data because maybe on the right side the ca cable would break but not on the left side so they decided we do it completely differently we leave the cars in their in their batches uh, in the company and we have the same team for every step of the process to build up the car meaning at the first one uh, uh, for the rebuild for example after the race you get a 10 tie wraps, uh, half a liter of uh, gearbox oil, whatever, this and that screw, etc. They made sure that the cars are identical. And you never have identical cars when you let teams uh, build up different cars because we also have the human factor. Yeah, Every mechanic wants to make the best car. So when you break this, you, 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 you do this. So we are not only collecting data. We have a unbelievable high and quality management of course when 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 we check every part after the races you know exactly which running time every part every screw every little detail has on the car before it collapses and of course you change it before so yeah the quality management is on a high-end level of course as well for every single part in uh, in the race car and sometimes i i don't know if you uh, um, matthias will uh, will agree to that uh, we, in the background, as suppliers, we think, how can this happen now on the racetrack? How can this happen? Everything is done so perfectly, and nevertheless, always 
some of the cars have failures here and there and everywhere. And uh, that is a big secret in motorsport, which I sometimes don't understand. But you always also have the human factor. We should not forget about that. Somebody want to add to that, Matthias, Stefan? Yeah, maybe, maybe just trying to remember what the original question was. So how do we deal with the data and how do we deal with the outliers? We have a, a very, very specific advantage is we know the operating conditions of our products very well in advance. We know very much which race we are doing, what the corners will be like. So compared to other industries, uh, we know what's, what, what will be happening out, out there. So on our side, it's much easier to detect the outliers uh, and outliers are less relevant than if you just compare. And that's currently the verge of where we try to find our niche with a lot of the analytics side that we're doing. And that, that compared to the automotive industry, motorsports uh, has a longer history in having complete data recordings. What we see now with connected cars and with autonomous driving, that's getting more and more into, in, in, into the field of passenger cars as well. I would say maybe just aerospace, uh, yeah. Aerospace and aeronautical has a, even as long history of data recording and a lot of simulation because for them, for us, it's the single race on the weekend. But it's, if you launch a rocket into space, there's only there's just one chance. There is not another race in two weeks. So you rather have to make sure that everything runs perfect at this one trial because still everything that you do is an experiment. It's not. We are not racing every day of the week. It's really this Sunday race is very, very important. So how do we deal with outliers? Uh, and the other advantage, something that Ellen mentioned earlier, is yes, we, we can bring a lot of insight into other industries because we know quite well under which conditions we will operate. So our experiment and our simulation has very, very well-defined boundary conditions that we will then replicate in the real world. And that helps us to play a lot with the simulation models, with our test methods, with our labs, to really find real where is the difference between the simulated world, between the tested world, because the lab even is not the real world, and between the real world. And what is a good and applicable and representative test for which problem? Um, and then we can we can give our our results and our insights to people to bring it to their industry. Yeah, and, and Christian, by the way, this is this is what I found as well. You know, so I think uh, Formula One operates in a very controlled environment, even though it seems crazy. You know, but we all know what the tracks are. We know what the curves are. We know what the pavement looks like. You know, we want to know what the cars are like. You know, we've got practice runs. We've got Friday, Saturday, and then we have Sunday for the real races. There are lots of things. But here's the irony of all this. The irony. When you actually sit there and watch a race, the race really gets interesting when the outliers happen. <laughs> you know, the races, when the cars operate in the controlled environment, the races are boring. Because, you know, like what they're going to do, you know, when Verstappen is in front and nothing happens, you know, he's got and So, you know, all these things, but then suddenly the rainstorm begins or something radically begins that maybe we have not simulated, have not tested. And that's when the audience goes wild because then all bets are off and, and you can't even keep up anymore with the data. So that to me is kind of the inherent tension of the sport. On one hand, we want to operate in a controlled environment, have all these sort of wonderful things that we do, but that's not what the audience wants. The audience wants the crazy, the outlier. That's kind of what they enjoy. <laughs> well, I totally agree to that. <laughs> My, for myself, it's the same. When the rain starts, it's great. The race gets, <laughs> gets exciting. But also at the rain, human factor, I, sh I think you would all agree the driver is the big difference yes. very often. And that is also interesting because every driver is so trained nowadays and so prepared that under normal conditions, they are very, very similar. Even a driver with less talent, when you put them to driving simulator lessons, etc., etc., you have all the simulations just to give you a number uh, because I forgot uh, before. Thanks for reminding me, Matthias. It was, um, we have a, like, it's very normal that we have like 100,000 simulated laps in different conditions before the race. And even during the race weekend, easily between two practices, you do 20, 30, 40,000 laps, uh, big data collection. And, um, but it gets exciting when the real talent can show 
and experience. And that is always when is something which was not expected or which is a, a bit away from the normal, let's say, the normal dry, yes. sunny conditions. You know, it's, uh, it's entertainment after all, right? So, I mean, even though we take it very seriously as a race, but it's, a, it's an entertainment. So I want to just read maybe just one quick sentence to you, which I think summed it up really well, which came from Patrick Luis, who was the CEO at the time. And he said, there are six ingredients to win. Top drivers, good brains, skilled hands, a certain budget, a high-performing race team, and luck. <laughs> and you put all these together, he says, and all of them, all of them have to be perfectly blent together in order to be successful. So maybe that's the secret. <laughs> maybe, maybe there are some similarities to companies. companies. You know, <laughs> the, CEO, the CEO is the driver, you know, the, the car is the, the company, and we live in very challenging times right now. Several uh, companies, uh, businesses, upside down you know it's raining it's storming um and uh, i think uh, company leaders um they um they have to deal with that uh, uncertainty uh react flexible and agile and uh, um and experimentation uh hopefully helps to to look at different scenarios where things go down or go up uh, actually i have to mention that at our institute we we also do several uh, do a simulation with factories. Uh, we build a model of a factory and then and then run scenarios. It's really interesting how systems react and, and act. So uh, I, th I see uh, there are lots of similarities between motorsports and 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 companies. But let's let me let me look into the audience. Are there any other questions or hints or statements from you to the panel? One more, okay. So, uh, following with this uh, Formula One and uh, the recent season, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what do you think, uh, looking at several uh, teams that were dealing a lot with uh, purposing and uh, with the changes in regulation, what do you think was the lack uh, or that you were uh, not taking into account when doing all these simulations and all these innovations uh, or changes in the cars that were basically um, leading to not knowing or not being aware about this problem? Well, I, I could say they are not using our software, the team software. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying the ABL software would have prevented that? Then, it, then you must be on a steep sales trajectory as of now. <laughs> Well, it's always, I think, uh, yeah, Matthias is longer in Formula One uh, uh, than me, much longer, but I would say it's difficult, um, of course, with the budget caps and a complete new car. But nevertheless, it was surprising in a way. Yes, everything we talked about was about the, pre uh, pro uh, the preparation, the processes, the testing, the simulation, and nevertheless, some of the teams had this problem. Badly, still have. And uh, that shows that um, there are still some secrets to solve in this sport. Yeah, I think, I mean, it, th that is one of the prime examples where we see um, that sometimes an entire industry can get very too trustworthy in the technologies they are using and not looking left and right. And if you, if you only rely on CFD and only rely on your wind tunnel, and both, one is, a, is just a simulation model, which is completely wrong, and the other one is just a lab, which is completely wrong, because both is not the real world. One is a, is, is a mathematical representation of the real world that can give you some insight, but doesn't tell you the whole story, and the other one is just a lab, it's just a test trick. Uh, and, I mean, simple reason is both, both CFD and the wind tunnels run quasi-steady state and not dynamic. And that's what you're missing. But we all have thought with the experiences and the correlation from the past seasons that we know where the differences are. And now we've designed a completely new car, which has certain effects that we have never seen before. So we have not correlated our simulation models and we have not correlated our wind tunnels properly. There, and then it, that's the failing. And I think uh, after this season, there is a lot of advancement in CFD for vehicle aerodynamics and a lot of advancement in how to run a wind tunnel to see more dynamic effects there. I would want to add to that. Uh, it's a great explanation. I want to add to that uh, again with uh, uh, 
quoting the famous statistician George Box. You know, he was a grand figure sort of in the field, uh, again, of statistics, uh, son-in-law of, uh, of R.A. Fisher, you know, founder of statistics and design of experiments. And he said something which we should all remember. All models are wrong. Some models are useful. Okay, again, all models are wrong. Some models are useful. And I think we need to keep that in mind as we're thinking about all these different models, whether it's CFD, simulations, everything that we build is just some representation of reality that has different aspects that it gets right and then some aspects it gets wrong. The point here is to use all these different models in a way that they become useful, useful to the engineers, useful to the drivers, and then kind of be engaged in that feedback cycle. Uh, I think the usefulness is a really, really important part because I go out and I deal a lot with modeling companies and some of the things that they do are not so useful. <laughs> and, and again, all models are wrong by definition. That's why they're models. And uh, and we need to kind of really think about which, which parts to emphasize. Thank you, Stefan. Any more comments or questions? <laughs> Last possibility we have to come to an, to an end. Maybe that was a good last statement, Stefan. <laughs> All models are wrong. I have to remember that. Some, Some are models useful. are useful. So that's the <laughs> second sentence is important. Some are useful. Uh, Gerhard? As long as you have a market, never give up to find the right solution. Yeah, the market is a driver of the solution and not the model and not the idea, the market is the driver. What does it mean to have a solution without any market? Think about it. waste money we cannot afford. Thank you, Gerhard. We engineers like to work on solutions, but where is the problem for the solution, right? <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ellen Lohr, for coming to, to us. Thank you, Matthias Tank, for your time. Thanks and for having thanks me. Thanks again, Stefan, uh, thank for you. your time in Boston. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay, it's time to finish up. Uh, Marion Unek, I, I guess we, we lifted on, on stage. Is this okay? Um, yeah. yeah, okay, good. Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, we, we, get, we are already hungry, so we'll finish up in the next two, three minutes. Um, I would like to thank everybody involved uh, in this year's project uh, to make that happen, to make the day happen. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for coming um, and uh, uh, also the, the guys uh, on the audience on the live stream. Without interested people, partners and supporters, the product innovation would not be possible. I would like uh, to thank all company partners of this year's course uh, for your commitment, especially the company Astrotech, AVL, uh, ÖBB, Traintech, OMV, Palfinger and Pyre. I would like to thank Itzdok Palcic from uh, the Vice Dean of the University of Maribor for coming today. And I would like to thank also Jacqueline Koppel from Pace University in New York. Uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, this is the first year we don't have students from New York with us. Hopefully next year this will change again. Thanks to the mentors, uh, Anton Scheibelmasser, head of uh, R&D Insort, Gerald Jaritz from uh, GJ Denkfabrik, Michael Müller, uh, head of engineering Müller office, Peter Heidel, scientific uh, assistant of TU Graz, Pierre Baumann, head of PTC SMD development and technology, and Stefan Hauswiesner, CEO of Reactive Reality, for supporting our teams with insights from the industry. A special thanks to Andrea Huber, Andrea Hooper is an opera singer 
and for, uh, thank you for sharing and improving the vocal and presentation skills and spending a lot of time uh, with practicing with the students, especially with the engineering students. Thank you. And uh, Andrea, please come up on stage, and also uh, Anne Lore, if you uh, please come up on stage once more. We have a little presence. Andrea, please stay here with, with us. Ellen, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. And please stay with, stay, stay with me. I'm accompanied by two ladies. It's seldom here at our engineering school. Um, I would like to thank uh, especially my staff, the coaches of this year's team, Atakan Kedenci of the team Astrotech, Kai Rüderle and Hugo Kare team AVL, Patrick Herstetter team ÖBB, Maria Huller and Florian Kulmer team OMV, uh, Heimo Preising team Palfinger and Andreas Kohlweiss team Paya. Uh, please come all on stage and so that we, we all can see you. Thank you very much for your support of the team. So the staff made sure that the teams, they push the teams, they made sure that the milestones are ready and they do the presentation right. <laughs> Thank you to our Fab Lab team, Lukas Kreilinger and Manuel Lesser. Uh, your guidance throughout the prototyping enabled the teams to build their ideas. Manuel Lesser, you have to stay right next to me, not somewhere, and you ha all have to come closer so that I'm not so alone here. Uh, Lukas uh, Greilinger still has to work in the, in, in the back. Uh, thanks to Maximilian Saiko, uh, who is a valuable asset and the first contact person for the students uh, uh, in our innovation project. And also our administrative office, especially Teresa Huber, Daniela Neukam, who cannot be here today, and Yasmin Sacrando. And uh, let me hand over that especially to you. Thank you. <laughs> and to Teresa, thank you very much. Um, thank you to all who supported today's Innovation Gala. That's Martina Mischkewitz, uh, Philipp Ruschal, Philipp Drescher, the catering team Wonisch, and our tech support uh, Stefan Lipic on the, on the technical uh, equipment back here. I would like to thank uh, Assistant Professor uh, Matthias Wolf as an advisor. He always found the right words for our students and uh, that was very valuable this year. And a very special thank you to the, our innovation group leader, Hans Schnell. Where is Hans? So Hans is the boss of this floor. Uh, he challenged all the teams, every single team, and it's very valuable to have you in this, in this, pro in this uh, course. Last but not least, I would like to thank our overall project manager of this year, that's Marion Unek. Uh, big hand for her. It was a tough year, she did a great job and uh, I would like to thank you again a lot. Uh, our students, please all come in for a group picture. All the students who worked this year from all the way up, Palfinger, uh, Razorheads Pyre, Hydroheads AVL, Optical Track ÖBB, uh, Carbon Booster OMV and Mindblow Astrotech. Let's come closer. So, I'm really proud of my students. The students did a great job. They worked hard. Today is, is payday. Everybody here? Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. And now it's time to get some drinks, and get some food.
Thank you. Okay, so we have some drinks outside, some food outside. Please enjoy yourself, talk to our students, talk to the ideas. And I'm looking forward to see you again uh, next year, hopefully. Thank you. Right.